All right. <clears throat> the scripture I'll be reading from this morning is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll read verses 17 through 21. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, <clears throat> for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. So my question this morning is, do you despise the church of God? When the early church celebrated the Lord's Supper, it seems it was much more physically nourishing than the symbolic method we use today. I suspect that the Passover feast materials were used, and so it was that people were fed there in a, in a physical sense as well as a spiritual sense. Imagine Paul's outrage then when this most sacred of feast was abused by such flagrant bad manners. From the accusations, one might conclude that the wealthy were the first in line. The first in line pigged out, leaving nothing for those who came later. If you were the first of the wine, you got drunk. No wonder Paul was upset. Note, however, the retort Paul throws at them. Do you despise the church of God? The terror of this behavior is not simply bad manners. Bad manners are usually a form of, a form of lack of respect. In this case, the lack was directed at the church itself. The church, however, is not the building. Indeed, in those days, they had no buildings but met in homes. The church is composed of its members. In other words, the rich, in this instance, were despising the poor, and in, and in despising them, despised the church. Could such a thing happen with us today? I regret to admit it could. When you take commu communion, do you look around and think, look at old so-and-so, that hypocrite. How he can dare to take communion without fear of the roof falling in on him. Whether it's outright condemnation or the more subtle, oh, I'll have to remember to pray for so-and-so's repentance. We tend to look around and see the sins and failings of others rather than examining ourselves. Make no mistake about it, this is judging others, as in judge not that ye be not judged. Just because it comes under the pious cloak of self-examination makes it no less judgment. Examining myself does not mean comparing myself to, to others. It means comparing myself to what God wants me to be. Ephesians 5.1 says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. When I judge others at the Lord's table, I'm saying that they're not good enough to partake, and I'm despising the church of God. The command is simple. Let a man examine himself and no one else. Do you bow your heads with me? Our Father in heaven, we want to come to you in prayer, and we want to thank you for... Um, this beautiful day, and we want to thank you um, for the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. We pray that as we partake of um, these emblems, that that uh, we'd remember to examine ourselves rather than examining others, and that that we could look in the mirror and see see the man that you would want us to be. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord, we just thank you and, and praise you for these emblems that you have given us, Lord, to, to take each week in remembrance of you. We pray, Lord, that you would bless this cup. In Jesus' name, amen. Nine hundred forty eight, number nine hundred forty eight, and now we'll sing number four hundred eighty eight. After this, Blake will have our scripture reading. Into the heart of Jesus, deeper and deeper I go, seeking to know the reason why he should love me so, why he should stoop to lift me up from the miry clay, saving my soul, making me whole, though I had wandered away. Into the will of Jesus, deeper and deeper I go, praying for force to follow, seeking his way to know, bowing in full surrender, low at his blessed feet, bidding him take, break me and make, till I am molded and meek. Into the joy of Jesus, deeper and deeper I go, rising with soul enraptured, far from the world below. Joy in the place of sorrow, peace in the midst of pain. Jesus will give, Jesus will give, he will uphold and sustain. Today's scripture is Luke 23, 33 through 43. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up. Uh, his clothes by casting lots. The people stood there, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. 
The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of Jews, of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hung their hurled insults at him, Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered them, him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Good morning. We've been in a uh, series of lessons on the cross. And last Lord's Day, we looked at Jesus' first statement from the cross. And in our time together of worship, we're going to look at Jesus' second statement from the cross. Now, when Jesus was sacrificed as the Lamb of God, when Pilate washed his hands and condemned him to be crucified, the Roman soldiers led him to a hill called the Skull, where Jesus would be crucified on a cruel Roman cross. Now, crucifixion was reserved for the lowest class of criminals, those guilty of insurrection, murder, and, and rebellion, robbers. It was for the lowest class of criminals that the Romans would crucify. And in some of the gospel accounts, this, this hill called the skull is named in Hebrew, Golgotha. And Calvary comes from the Latin, from Calvia, meaning skull. And so this hill is thought and believed to be located outside the city gates along a busy traveled crossroads. A place where everybody would be traveling, coming in and out of the city. And over there today in Jerusalem, there are a couple of traditional sites that are Calvary. One of them actually does, Gordon's Calvary. This man, Gordon, was the one that discovered it. It looks just like a skull. And when you take a picture of it from a distance, it, the whole rock hill looks like a skull. And it's there to this very day. Most likely that would, would have been the site where our Lord would have been crucified. It was called the skull. Golgotha Hebrew, Calvary from the Latin. The skull. It was Roman custom to hang the charged crime above the head of the one that was being crucified so that it would bring fear into the people that they wouldn't commit the same crime. And so we see in John's account, if you'll turn over to John chapter 19 of John's account at the cross, John chapter 19, starting in verse 18, John the 19th chapter, starting in verse 18, notice... There they crucified him, and with him two other men, one on either side, and Jesus in between. And Pilate wrote an inscription also and put it on the cross. And it was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore this inscription many of the Jews read, For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. And so the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. You know, Golgotha, Calvary, outside the city, with this busy traveled crossroads, where people coming in and out of the city would see it. The sign above Jesus' head is charged. Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. 
That was the full description. When you read the other gospel accounts, it says the king of the Jews. But what was in the full of that first gospel tract that was above Jesus' head was Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 13, uh, and starting in verse 11, Hebrews the 13th chapter, beginning in verse 11, talks about that of the sacrifice and being outside the camp about Jesus In verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 13, the Hebrew writer says, For the body of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Hence let us go out to him outside the camp. Bearing his reproach. Golgotha, the skull, located outside the camp, outside the city of Jerusalem on a busy traveled crossroads where everybody would see it. The sign was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek so that everybody would be able to read it and know that charge that was brought against our Lord and Savior as he was crucified on the hill of Calvary, the skull. I want us to see first this morning that Jesus was mocked by the crowds at the cross, mocked. And in Matthew's account, I want to read uh, a few of the gospel accounts. Go to Matthew chapter 27 of those that mocked Jesus at the cross. In Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 39, we'll read verses 39 through 44. Notice what Matthew in in his account writes. Beginning in verse 39, those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, huh, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let him deliver him now, if he takes pleasure in him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers also who had been crucified with him were casting the same insult. Now, go to Mark's account, Mark chapter 15, Mark the 15th chapter. Starting in verse 29, Mark chapter 15, verse 29, Mark records, And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha, you are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also along with the scribes were mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may believe. And those who were crucified with him were casting the same insult at him. And we've seen in our scripture reading in Luke the 23rd chapter, in verse 35, Luke 23, verse 35 says that the people who stood by looking on, even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him coming up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. We see here this mocking. It's first of the list is the passers-by. Those out of just curiosity, loving to, to watch somebody suffer and die. Many had just come to watch the crucifixion. And of these passers-by... Many of them lived in the city of Jerusalem. They were Jews that lived there. 
And many of them would have been pilgrims that had come to the city of Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover festivities. And so these passers-by were hurling their abuse. They were wagging their heads at him, which is, a, is an expression of contempt, reproach, mocking him, sneering at him, making fun of him, laughing at him. Oh, you who's going to rebuild, destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross and we'll believe in you. And then we have at the cross the Jewish hierarchy, the rulers, the ones that had Jesus condemned and put to death, which consisted of the chief priest, the elders, and the scribes, the, the experts of the law, and keeping it written down and passed on to generation to generation. All of the religious hierarchy were saying among themselves, oh, he saved others. He can't save himself. You know, if... He's the son of God. God will deliver him. God will rescue him. He said he was the son of God. You know, come down, Jesus, and we'll believe in you. <laughs> Even if Jesus would have came down, they still would not have believed in him. If they, you know, think about this. The greatest miracle and sign was the resurrection, and many of them still didn't believe in him. So even if he would have come down from the cross, this religious hierarchy that delivered him up out of envy still wouldn't have changed their hearts. And then we have the soldiers mocking him and giving him sour wine and saying, Ah, you king of the Jews, save yourself. And did you notice in Matthew and Mark's account with the two thieves? Both thieves were mocking Jesus at the beginning. Both of them. Matthew and Mark tell us that both, one on each side that was crucified with Jesus Christ, were mocking Jesus. Don't miss that. You know, Satan was still tempting Jesus even to the very end. He was using these people at the cross. He was using the passers-by. He was using the chief priests, elders, and scribes. He was using the soldiers. He was using the two thieves on each side. If you be the Son of God, come down. Save yourself. Self-preservation rather than self-sacrifice. It's no wonder that we find in the beginning of our Lord's ministry when Jesus came to reveal that He was the Son of God on earth at the age of 30, was baptized by John the Baptist. Immediately He was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. One of those temptations, Satan took Jesus on a high mountain. He said, if you be the Son of God, He showed Him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And He said, if you bow down and worship Me, I'll give you that. You won't have to go to a cross. Here's a shortcut. You won't have to have self-sacrifice. Here's self-preservation. You can, you can have all of this of the world in its earthly glory if you'll just bow down and worship me. It's interesting in the middle of Jesus' earthly ministry when Peter had made that great confession that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, and Jesus said, upon that confession I'll build my church. Right after that, starting in verse 21 of Matthew chapter 16, Jesus began to reveal Himself to the apostles, saying that I must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things, be rejected by the chief priests, scribes, and elders, and be killed, and be raised upon the third day. And the Bible tells us, as soon as Jesus said that, Peter took the Lord aside and rebuked Him and said, God forbid that that should happen to you, Lord. And then Jesus rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, for you are a stumbling block to me. For your interest is not upon God's interest. Your mind's not upon God's interest, but upon man's. Why did he say, get behind me, Satan? You're a stumbling block to me. Because Satan was using Peter right there to discourage Jesus from that of self-sacrifice and going to the cross to self-preservation, to, to avoid the cross. The beginning, the end. The, the middle and the end while Jesus is dying, Satan's still at work. He's using this mob. Come down from the cross. Save yourself. You don't have to die for mankind not knowing that if Jesus, though He could have come down from the cross, you and I wouldn't be able to be saved. You know, this was all fulfillment of Psalm chapter 22. The prophecy was being fulfilled. Go to Psalm, the 22nd chapter. It's one of the rich messianic chapters of the cross and in the midst of all these prophecies in Psalm chapter 22 notice in verses 6 through 8 Psalm 22 verse 6 through 8 
The psalmist says, but I am a worm, not a man. A reproach of men and despised by the people. All who sneer at me, or in other words, mock at me. They separate with the lip. They wag their head, saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let Him deliver Him. Let Him rescue Him, because He delights in Him. That's exactly what you read in Matthew's account, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 39, of the wagging of their heads. And this very verse here, being in, in verse 8, in, found in Matthew 27, verse 48, of that of coming down from the cross. In verse 43, Matthew 27, verse 43. That's what the scribes and the elders were saying. If he's the king of Israel, let God deliver him. He claimed to be the son of God. Let him deliver him. And that prophecy was being fulfilled by Satan using these very people at the cross tempting Jesus to come down from the cross so that you and I would not be able to be saved. The crowds that mocked Him. Second, Jesus was numbered with the transgressors. Luke tells us in Luke chapter 23 verse 33 that Jesus was crucified with two criminals, with Jesus in the middle. And I want you to go to Mark's account, go to, to Mark chapter 15, the Gospel of Mark chapter 15. And in verse 27 and 28, Mark records, they crucified two robbers with him, one on his right, one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, he was numbered with the transgressors. These two thieves were probably partners in crime. And most likely, they were in the crowd with Barabbas. Think about who else would have been crucified with these two men. That middle cross, Barabbas was spared from. Remember, Pilate gave him a choice. And Barabbas, guilty of insurrection and murder and, and that of robbery were probably all three partners in crime, but two of them are being crucified. One on the right, one on the left. Barabbas was released by the people. Jesus was condemned to be crucified by the Jewish people. And so we see here these partners in crime, one on the right and one on the left. And that prophecy of Isaiah chapter 53, go to the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied this of Jesus Christ and and being numbered with the transgressors. I want you to see verse 12 is the prophecy, but also notice in verse 9. In Isaiah 53 verse 9 says that his grave was assigned with who? Wicked men. Those two thieves that died on each side of him. Those wicked men. That's the prophecy. And then notice in verse 12. Isaiah 53 verse 12, Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great. He will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Jesus died with the transgressors, one on each side. At the Last Supper, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, go there to Luke chapter 22, and notice what Jesus said at the Last Supper, Luke the 22nd chapter, Luke chapter 22, in verse 37, Jesus says at the Last Supper, For I tell you that this which is written must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For that which refers to me has its fulfillment. And that fulfillment came on the day of Calvary when Jesus was crucified between two transgressors, between two criminals, two robbers and thieves, one on each side, one on the right and one on the left. Now think about this. Jesus, why did He come into the world? He came into the world to save sinners, transgressors like you and me. When Joseph found out when he was engaged to marry and that she was pregnant, he knew it wasn't his child. He was going to divorce her, put her away secretly. But the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and told him that she would bear him a son. And you will name him Jesus. For it is he who will save his people from their sins. 
Matthew 1 verse 21. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. It's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all, among whom I am chief. Jesus, the Lamb of God, that takes away the sins of the world, He who seeks and saves that which is lost, came into the world to save transgressors. He came into the world to save sinners like you and me. And we see that not only did He come to save sinners, but Jesus died for sinners. He died for you and me. Romans chapter 4 verse 25 Paul says in Romans the 4th chapter and verse 25 that Jesus was delivered up for our transgressions. He was delivered up for my transgressions, your transgressions, and He was raised for our justification. Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3, I delivered unto you as first importance that which also that I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Jesus died for our sins, and He died for sinners, for transgressors. And He who was separate from sinners died between two sinners. He was separate from sinners as the Hebrew writer shares because of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 says that He was tempted in all ways as we are and yet without sin. And in Hebrews chapter 7... In verse 26, the Hebrew writer says about the resurrected Lord, For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He was separate from sinners, died between two sinners. Jesus identified Himself with sinners. Even though He was sinless, righteous, holy, the innocent Lamb, He identified Himself with sinners when He became sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says that God made Jesus who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God through Him. Peter put it this way, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross. Jesus literally became sin. And He identified Himself with sinners when He took my sins, your sins, and the world's sins in His body on the cross. Taking the, God's wrath and drinking that cup of punishment and judgment in our place with that vicarious substitutional death. Sacrificial loving death in my place and your place. Jesus died with sinners for sinners. And it's only fitting that He died between two sinners. I want you to notice the, the bulletin article by George McLeod in the bulletin there entitled, Only One Way Left. George writes of this poem of Only One Way Left, I simply argue that the cross be raised again at the center of the marketplace as well as on the steeple of the church. I'm recovering the claim that Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral between two candles, but on a cross between two thieves, on a town garbage heap, at a crossroad so cosmopolitan that they had to write his title in Hebrew and in Latin and in Greek, at the kind of place where cynics talk smut, the thieves curse, and the soldiers gamble. Because that is where He died. And that is what He died about. And that is where Christ's men ought to be and what church people ought to be about. That of the cross and the message to sinners. Because that's why Jesus came into the world. He came into the world to save sinners. He died for sinners. He was separate from sinners, but He died between two sinners, only fitting. He died with sinners for sinners. And He literally became sin in our place so that we could have forgiveness and salvation that we see at the cross. Third, he who deserved hell got heaven. You know, you've seen from Matthew and Mark's account, at first 
both thieves were mocking Jesus. Both of them. But somewhere in the midst of that, one of those thieves had a change of heart. He began to see Jesus in a different light. And he had a change of heart. And he cried out in repentance to the Lord while Jesus was dying. In our scripture reading, Luke records in Luke the 23rd chapter, verse 39, one of the criminals who was hanging there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, today, today, you shall be with me in paradise. What changed this man? One minute he's mocking Jesus. The next, next minute he's repenting and crying out to the Lord Jesus. What changed him? Something in Jesus' demeanor. That present demeanor on the cross that he saw in Jesus' face. Maybe it was along with the lines of Jesus' first statement from the cross. His prayer for his offenders. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. The dignity that he saw Jesus dying with. Something touched his heart and changed him right there. To lead him to repentance. He admitted that he was getting what he deserved. He rebuked his fellow partner in crime and saying, Do you not fear God? Don't you know that we're suffering because we are suffering justly? We're getting what we deserve, but this man is innocent. And then he cried out to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Something convinced him that that sign above Jesus' head was true. Think about what that sign said. Jesus. It means Savior. It's off the foreigner Joshua. He'll be called Jesus because He'll save His people from their sins. There was something that convinced Him that that sign was true, that Jesus, the Savior, and that He was a King and that He had a Messianic kingdom and that He would usher it in. And so He said, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. I'll tell you one of the most remarkable things that we miss. He turned to Jesus when Jesus was rejected, abused, weak, and dying. Would you? Would you trust in a Savior that was rejected, weak, abused, and dying and humiliated before the world? Think about that. What faith this man had. He came to believe in Jesus when he's dying. Jesus, remember me. Come in your kingdom. And Jesus looked right at him. Truly I say to you, today, don't miss that, today, you shall be with me in paradise. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. He wasn't baptized. Yeah, that's true. We've seen that in the adult class. But unfortunately, what most brethren get out of the out of the lesson of the penitent thief is that very thing. Chomping at the bits to say, Russell, be sure to tell him that he wasn't baptized because of those things. Which is true. It needs to be pointed out. It needs to be pointed out that Jesus was still alive when he said to him, Today you shall be with me in paradise. And as what we discussed in Bible class, while Jesus was on earth, he had the authority to forgive sins. And he'd done it on a few occasions where he directly told a person, you are forgiven. And they wasn't baptized because he was God. And God can forgive sins. God can see the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at what? The heart. And Jesus saw this man's heart repenting and turning. And he said, today you shall be with me in paradise. It's true that he died under the old law. 
The old law was still in effect as we've seen in Bible class this morning. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15 and 16 says that it takes the death, the shedding of blood in order for a covenant to be established. Jesus told him he was saved on the old side of the cross, of the law. Still in effect. After Jesus' resurrection, Jesus commanded his apostles to what? Go and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and is baptized shall be saved. He who is disbelieved shall be condemned. All men under the New Covenant, the New Testament, are commanded to be baptized for the mission of their sins. Peter did it on the day of Pentecost when he convinced them that they had crucified Jesus, this one whom God had made both Lord and Christ. Paul himself, Saul of Tarsus, was commanded by Ananias, Arise, why delay? Be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21 says, Baptism now saves you. Not the removal of the dirt from the flesh, but an appeal of a good conscience before God. And so God commands under the new covenant for all men to be baptized, to be forgiven of his sins. It also needs to be pointed out, as we talked about in Bible class, that this is not an example to encourage last minute salvation, deathbed penitence. Many people who say, well, I'm going to get all the gusto out of life that I can get, and then just before I die, then I'm going to repent. Many people who want to wait till the 11th hour die at 1030. Think about that parable of the, of the vineyards in, out in the, the labors in the vineyard in Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16. Those first that were hired the first hour, and then those were the, hired at the 11th hour, the last hour, they got paid the same. And it, and it seems like it's not fair. For Christians have been Christians all their life. And then somebody is a Christian one day and they're saved. And they may die and go on. That's God's judgment. Not mine. We want to tell God how to dispense His grace. That was the mistake that the elder brother of the prodigal son made, wasn't it? Think about it. That was the mistake that the elder brother made with the father. Trying to tell him how to dispense His grace. We need to learn to let God be God. He's God. And if God forgives sin and He says your sins are forgiven, you're forgiven. And so in that realm, we mustn't play God. But at the same time, don't miss it. Don't miss the remarkable conversion of a man that's dying in sin and cries out with true repentance to God. And Jesus said, today, you shall be with me in paradise. He didn't come to believe in Jesus after He was resurrected and glorified King of kings and Lord of lords and ascending into heaven. He came to believe in Jesus while He was dying on a cross, weak, rejected, abused, humiliated. And there's something about Jesus' demeanor that convinced Him that that sign above His head that He was who He claimed to be, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the King of, of the world, that God had sent into this world to save you and me because Jesus, He came into the world to save sinners. He died for sinners. And he died with sinners, for sinners, between two sinners. Someone has well pointed out, as Jesus was dying for the sins of all mankind, it was only forgetting for him to forgive a penitent sinner. And as Jesus was dying to save all sinners, it was only for fitting for him to save a penitent sinner next to him. Jesus Remember me when you come in your kingdom. Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Some people think that they are too far gone, that they're hopeless, that they can't be saved, they can't be forgiven. My life's too much of a mess. If God can save a thief, He can save you and me. If our heart is penitent and comes to Him under His terms. If God can forgive this thief, He can forgive you and me. And that's why this story is recorded in the Bible. As long as there is life and breath, don't give up on your loved ones. Don't give up on no matter how crude they may see against Jesus and His teachings and His Word, don't give up on them. 
Still love them. Be patient because you never know, folks, what will change a person's heart. Who would ever thought that that thief would change his heart while he's dying on a cross? We would have been writing a story that would have been totally different, wouldn't it? You bet it would have been. But God didn't. And God gave us the story of hope. Long as there's life and breath, if a person will turn his heart to Jesus Christ, he can be cleansed, forgiven, and receive eternal life. Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. He who deserved hell got heaven. We all deserve hell. But Jesus offers us heaven. And He came into the world to save sinners. He came into the world to save transgressors. You and me. Are you saved? What's holding you back? Come and be saved. Don't wait till the 11th hour. You may die at 1030. We don't know when we'll pass away from this world or Jesus comes again. If you're subject to the invitation this morning, if we can help you in any way, won't you come while we stand, while we sing? I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. Now is the time that we uh, take up the offering. Can you bow your heads with me, please? Dear God, thank you for blessing us in so many ways. Um, Thank you for blessing us spiritually as well as physically. We pray that um, we'd be willing to give with generous hearts and uh, give back a portion um, of what you bless us with. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. For announcements, uh, Wilma Putman, mother of Karen Smith, is in the Garden City Hospital. She had surgery for depression ulcer on Friday and is now being treated for wound care. She also is refusing to eat most of the time, so is on a nutrition plan, so let's keep her in her prayers. Also, we got a men's business meeting after closing prayer. And also next week, they're going to start taking pictures 
upgrading the pictures out here on the board. And then there are several events coming up. So if you want to follow on the bulletin, on May the 29th, we got Scott Robinson who will be speaking to us. Scott, we are graduating from Bear Valley Preaching School this May. June the 4th, got a picnic at the Brentings Ranch. They will provide hamburgers, hot dogs, and drinks. We are asked to bring side dishes, lawn chairs. Rob, Roger Bandina will be there so we can visit with him. It will be at, at 6 p.m. And then June the 5th, Roger Medina will be speaking to us. Roger is publishing Bible lessons and study materials in Spanish. Also, the locks on the north and south door to the building have been changed. You can get a new key from Beverly. And then the directory change, Jim and Cindy Emmel's cell phone numbers were mistakenly switched when they were put in the directory. Please switch the numbers around so you can get a hold of the person you wish to speak to. Any other announcements today that need to be made? If not, please, let's be standing while Brother Brent leads us in closing prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the privilege of assembling together to bring praise and glory to your name. And we, Father, just pray that our worship to you today has found favor in your eyes. And Father, I pray that you'd be with Wilma Putnam. Lord, strengthen her, and I pray that... Uh, that she could enjoy better health and be with Karen and Jim also. Father, I just I ask that as we fellowship together with a meal, that you would bless that. And, and thank you so much again for your love and for the sacrifice of your son. In whose name we pray, amen.